Welcome to First Wednesday Worship at Woodlawn. If you want to stand with us, we're here to worship the King of Kings tonight. Amen.
Could you let him know all across the room tonight? God, you've been good to me. God, you've been faithful to me, God. Even when I was undeserving of it, oh God, you loved me. You extended grace and mercy to my life, oh God. You have been faithful. You have been good, God. I've got to give you praise tonight. Every good thing, every blessing comes from you, oh God. I give you thanks tonight, Jesus. Come on, Woodlock, just for a moment, would you tell him that? God, you've been faithful. You've been good. I worship you for it tonight, oh God. Scripture tells us that God doesn't change. We quote it oftentimes that he's the same what? Yesterday, today, forever. We've heard it quoted many times in this very house. And sometimes we just hear those words and we let it roll right off our back. But I want to tell someone maybe tonight you've walked in and you're not standing in the place where you see the goodness of God. Maybe you're enduring a trial. Maybe you've been faced with some adversity this week. I want to tell you those words one more time, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if he was good in the past, if he's been faithful despite the heartache, pain, and difficulties of life, he's going to be faithful in your today. He's going to be faithful in your future, in your tomorrow. You can put your confidence in him. So before we're seated, I wonder if you just lift both hands toward heaven right now and you would begin to vocalize that toward him right now. God, I believe that you are a good God. You're a faithful God. You know where I am. You know what I'm facing. You know the mountain that may be before me. And God, you've been faithful. You've been a healer in the past. And God, I declare your goodness, your ability, your power, your strength in my today, God. I just believe that if you are faithful before, Lord, you're going to be faithful again. God, you are a good God. You're a faithful God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
I give you thanks tonight. I give you thanks tonight. How we can testify that God is a good God. He is a good God. Amen, amen, amen. Well, welcome to First Wednesday Worship at Woodlawn. We got all of our adults in the building, our kids, our students. This is like family night. We just come together as one, and we're pumped up, excited that you're here. Why don't you slap your neighbor a high five? Don't slap your neighbor. Slap your neighbor a high five. And then you can be seated once you've done that. You can be seated in the house. We had an amazing, amazing day uh, Sunday at Easter in our service here. I told Pastor I'm not going to steal his thunder. I'm going to let him, uh, you know, celebrate with you about how many people were here. So I won't do that, but it was an awesome, awesome day. You probably noticed some things that were a little, little different than the last time we were gathered together on a Sunday when you were here this past week. And one of those things you might have noticed that in the seat back in front of you, there is not a connect card. In the seat back in front of you, there's not a tithing envelope, right? It looks a little different. Uh, but just as a reminder for those that may have questions or concerns, we still do believe in returning your tithe back to God. We're just gonna ask you to do it from one of our giving stations. So right here in the very front of the altar area, right over here by our baptistry, also in the back and up top, there are not, not only give boxes, but there are tithing envelopes available for you. So take advantage of that. We just wanted on this kind of family night to remind you there's pencils there, and there are also you belong here and prayer request cards that are be located in those various places. So while you are talking, you are you know, enjoying fellowship with people before service, if you want a tithing envelope, you can grab it at any of those six locations. But you may be asking, what's up with this QR code at my seat? What's up with it? Is this the mark of the beast? Is this, what is this, right? What we are doing is we're trying to make things easier for you, but also easier for our team that compiles uh, various amounts of data. So here's what you can do. I want you to grab your phone real quickly here. Grab your phone. This is not QR codes for dummies, because that sounds really bad. This is just the cliff notes on uh, QR codes, all right? Pun intended. All right. So if you don't know and you're like, I don't know how to operate one of these newfangled uh, QR codes and I don't want to learn, this is your opportunity. First thing that you do not do is take a picture of it. If you take a picture of a QR code, you just have another new uh, photo in your albums on your, on your phone there. But if you'll open your camera up and you will tap the QR code, uh, you will be led to a screen that we'll talk about in a moment. So each Sunday moving forward, there will be a QR code just like the one that is behind me on the screen, but conveniently, Additionally, there is one on your armrest as well. We say that QR codes now belong on your armrest. They belong here, all right? So at any moment when you walk in on Sunday, if you say, hey, I have a prayer need or I would like to sign up for you belong here, I would like to give, I wanna know more about baptism, whatever it might be, you can quickly, easily, you don't have to wait for the giving moment, but you can at the seat back in front of you, just kidding, at the, at the armrest that you are on, you can pull your phone out, open up that QR code, and it will lead you to a place that we are calling the hub. If you'll go to the next, the, there we go, the hub there. You have four different options at this time uh, through that QR code. You can sign up for You Belong Here. You can say, hey, I'm interested in baptism. I wanna know more about baptism. You can give there. Uh, any tithes or offering. And then you see at the very bottom, our pastoral care request. What this is, is this is a uh, new way of saying prayer request. And so if you have an uh, upcoming surgery, you have a need that you want our leadership team, our senior pastor, and those that are a part of our pastoral care team to be made aware of and pray with you about, 
you can fill that out and it will instantly uh, be delivered to us. And so I'm encouraging you, if you have never dove off into the world of QR codes, it's not a sin uh, that we know of. We'll find out on Judgment Day. Uh, no, I'm kidding. It's not a sin. It's not a sin, but it is the quickest and easiest way for you to get signed up for various things, but also for, for you to uh, make us aware of a prayer request, a pastoral care uh, request. And so you can certainly still do it the other ways. Uh, you can fill out all those things, drop them off in the give boxes. But we wanted you, excuse me, <clears throat> we wanted you to be aware of why we did this and, and how it operates. So it's very easy. Once again, get your camera. Don't take a picture. Oftentimes you'll just tap on your screen. Uh, it will lead you to the link that is our hub where you'll have these four options. These options may change, but for now, that's, that's what those are there for. Take advantage of them, uh, and we, we appreciate that. Everybody say, I got it. I got it. How many love our pastor and are so appreciative of his vision, his heart for this house? If you love Pastor Jaron, let him know. Thank you, Brother Cliff, and uh, for some reason, it doesn't look as crowded out here tonight. That's probably because there's uh, well over 200 new seats here, and everybody comfortable? Everybody good? Why don't we give God a hand for this amazing room that we, that we have, and uh, we're so thankful for this past, this past Sunday, our first, uh, our first Sunday back. Uh, which happened to be Easter Sunday. It just worked out that way. I promise you we didn't program it that way because if I had it to do over, the stress getting ready for Easter Sunday and getting back in the building was, uh, was, was pretty tough. But God helped us and he put his stamp of approval on it and we broke our all-time attendance record this past Sunday, 1,228 in the house. Come on, somebody. Amen. That was pretty awesome. To put that in perspective, before the remodel, we only had 1,085 seats. So we would have had to put out 100, almost 140 seats just to handle the crowd uh, this past Sunday. And so why don't we just tell God how awesome that is, and we're thankful for that. And uh, never would I have thought that we'd have had a parking issue Literally, cars were parking at the student center. Thank God for Brother Will Dunaway and his team and the golf cart ministry, bringing them uh, back over to the sanctuary. So just all good things. And uh, I have a lot of thanks to give for people that helped us. And, and I'll wait uh, probably till Sunday to do that. But so many people put so many hours uh, into, this, into this remodel. And, I, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for that. Amen. And... Uh, we are starting the book of Acts tonight, and uh, could not be more excited about uh, this Bible study that we're going to be that we're going to be sharing with you. If you have your Bibles, please you can you can get them out because I'm gonna I'm gonna make notes of, of several different scriptures and text uh, that uh, we'll be sharing tonight. Acts one through seven was our reading. And uh, I hope you are caught up with us. If not, I promise you, you can get caught up easy. Don't just say, well, I missed the first week. I'm going to throw in the towel this month. That is not the right spirit and attitude. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And uh, you just get back on the train, and uh, we're going to catch back up. We'll be through chapter 14 next, uh, next Wednesday night. Uh, but we will be taking our text tonight. Uh, from the first seven chapters of the book of Acts. And it is good to have our students and our kids. And uh, I love First Wednesday worship. We're going to be starting our baptism series this coming Sunday. And I believe on April the 21st, we are going to have dozens and dozens of people baptized, calling upon the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The book of Acts is traditionally uh, attributed to, to Luke, a physician who was also a companion of the Apostle Paul. Luke is believed to have 
than a meticulous historian. Do I have any historians in the house tonight? Anybody love history? Just, just wave at me. You would probably enjoy sitting down with, with Luke. He also authored, obviously, the Gospel of Luke, which serves as the first part to the two-part volume with Acts being the second volume. The book of Acts spans three decades, from around A.D. 30 to A.D. 60. It begins with the ascension of Jesus into heaven about 40 days after his resurrection, which we just preached about on Sunday, and concludes with Paul's imprisonment in Rome. The exact date of its writing is debated, but it was likely composed during Paul's first imprisonment around A.D. 62-63. Acts defends the authenticity of, of the Christian faith by recording miraculous events, by recording conversions and the growth of the church in spite of opposition and persecution. It provides evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the continuity between his ministry and the ministry of his followers. After his crucifixion, there must have been some confusion and possibly a lot of misunderstanding on the part of many of his disciples. After all the time they had spent with Jesus, the teachings that they had received concerning his death, his burial, his resurrection. When he died on the cross, I want you to know, like all of us, they were shaken to their core. What great faith they had while they walked with Jesus. This faith, I'm sure like we would have, it immediately vanished and they were ready to abandon all that he had instilled in them. Even Peter, who was so ready to pull his sword and fight in the garden, now returned to his boat and the nets that he was so familiar with. He said, I'll just go back to doing what I know and nobody can take that away from me. But now everything was okay. Everything had been set right. Jesus had, had risen from the dead. He had come back to life. He had walked with them. He had, he had talked with them. They had dined together. Surely now all things would be in its proper place. Luke closes this book with instruction a commandment, if you will. I go to Luke chapter 24, the last chapter of the first volume. Verses 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Verse 52, last verse of, of Luke 24. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. So they are obeying the commandment of the Lord. This is where Luke picks up the second volume, the book of Acts. And we get to Acts chapter 1 and he, he starts off where he ends the book of Luke. Acts chapter 1 verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. Does that sound familiar? but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so they tarry. What, is that, what does that mean, Pastor? They, it means they lingered with expectation. They, they could not wait for what, what was about to happen. They, they were just trying to abide in the presence of the Lord and, and they pray and they do the Lord's work of placing another apostle for Judas Iscariot who, who betrayed him, Acts 1 26, and they cast their lots and the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. And so he took Judas's place. So let me paint this picture for you. They are in Jerusalem just like Jesus told them. They are gathered in an upper room praying for the return of the comforter, whatever this promise was that he, he talked about. And so 
Now they are getting a little anxious. What's going to happen? Will he do what he says he will do? Will, will he really send the comforter? Will he keep his word? And will we recognize it when it happens? Because they didn't know what was going to take place. But God is never slack concerning his promises. Do I have a believer in the house tonight? God is never slack concerning his promises. If he promised you something, you can stand on his word because his promises are yea and amen. And so they waited day one, day two, day five, day seven, day nine. And on day 10, after he ascended into the heavens, the promise finally showed up. I take you to Acts chapter 2. If you don't have this marked in your Bible, would you please mark it? This is the birth of the church. In fact, my, my whole Bible lesson tonight, you can just call it the first church because that's what we're, that's what we're talking about. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and set upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The miraculous event drew the attention of Jews from every nation who were gathered in Jerusalem for this festival that was going on. And not only was Luke 24 and 49 and Acts chapter 1 verse 5 being fulfilled, but also Matthew chapter 16 verses 17 through 19 beginning to be fulfilled. And I take you there. Verse 17 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Here Jesus speaks of building his church. This is the first church. And he said he would give Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And I know I preached it to you, but I'm going to tell you again, when you got the keys, you can unlock something. When you got the keys, you can get into something. If you got the keys to your house, when you get home tonight, you can get in your house. When you got the keys to your car, when you go to the parking lot tonight, you can enter your car. Peter had the keys to the kingdom, and so he knew how to get inside the kingdom. It is here on the day of Pentecost that the church of Jesus Christ has its beginnings. It is here when the multitude came together and were confused because they did not understand how all the local believers who had not learned how to speak in multiple languages, but now they are actually speaking in multiple languages. Let's be honest. If, if we didn't know anything about that and we showed up, we would be perplexed as well. It is here in Acts chapter 2 that the Holy Ghost moves upon the Apostle Peter and with an anointing that he never knew he had, he stands and using the keys to the kingdom of heaven, he begins to preach a message that will be the cornerstone of the first church and open the door to the kingdom of heaven. Peter begins to preach and explain what they were witnessing was the fulfillment of of Joel's prophecy concerning the outpouring of the Spirit in the last days. He boldly proclaimed Jesus as the promised Messiah, crucified and risen from the dead. And he begins his message in chapter 2, verses 14, and concludes 23 verses later in verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. If you ever wondered if there's just one God, Acts chapter 2, verse 36 tells us all, he's made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Only 23 verses, but it was a message 
that was earth shattering to the listener. It brought conviction like nothing else could. The listeners were so convicted that they readily questioned Peter and the other apostles in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? If they are speaking in another language, what do I have to do to have this same guilt that was just poured out in their life? Up until to this point, Peter had only reminded them of the prophecy of old that foretold of this event that he had preached to them of their sin and betrayal of Jesus. But now he begins to use the keys. Everybody said he used the keys. Verse 38. If you've been in church for five minutes, you know this. Then Peter said to them, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall, somebody say shall, shall, shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is to you and your children, to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly receive his word... They, they obeyed what they had heard, were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. These new believers came from various backgrounds and cultures, but they were united by their faith in Jesus Christ and their commitment to following him as Lord and Savior. What an awesome beginning. A brand new church starting out with 3,120 members, and we thought we did something on Easter Sunday. I'm going to tell you something, 3,120 in just about 50 days was not a bad start to the church. That's a pretty good revival meeting, Brother Mallory. I pray that same spirit in this house. I want them to come from far and wide, not because we got new seats and a new platform, but because the spirit of the Almighty God is here, and when he's here, anything is possible. Acts 2, 42 through 47, this is what happens after the Holy Ghost is poured out. Same chapter. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and in prayers and fear came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. Verse 46 so continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness, simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. This is what produced revival. We saw Peter had the keys to the kingdom. He gave us the recipe, repent. Be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ. And it's a promise, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But after the Holy Ghost was poured out, he sent the apostles on a mission and this is what they did to have revival all over the region. The apostles' doctrine, they devoted, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I want you to know if it worked then, it still works now. I want to say that again. If it worked then, it still works now. God's not looking for a new recipe. It is still the apostles' doctrine. They continued in spiritual fellowship. They engaged in close-knit spiritual fellowship, sharing their lives and faith with one another. They continued steadfastly in breaking of bread. I don't know about you, but I like to break bread. Well, quit acting all high and mighty. You like to break bread too. They enjoyed sharing meals together. This also can... Be symbolic of the Lord's Supper. They, they took of the Lord's body and, and, and his blood together, signifying their unity as believers. They continued in prayer, wood line. I've never known a growing church that's not a praying church. We got to continue in prayer. Prayer is the war room where we put on the armor of God. Revival will not take place without prayer. 
They continued in brotherly love. They continued in daily service. They continued in unity. They were unified in purpose and spirit in spite of their diverse backgrounds and circumstances. They continued in joyful simplicity. Guess what? They were content. They didn't have to have material possessions and goods. They were content. God, I want your spirit above all else. God, I want your will above all else. And then the last verse says, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily. Can we just pray that right now? God, would you add to this church? God, I pray, Lord, for a hunger and a harvest. God, I pray that you would send us people that are far from you. God, that are looking for a way, God, to draw close to you. God, I, I pray, oh Lord God, that you would pour your spirit out in this region. God, you would pour your spirit out in this city, in the Pine Belt, God. I pray, God, that you would use us locally and nationally and globally, oh God, to send, oh God, men and women into the harvest, God. Compel them from the highways and the hedges and let them come to this house and let there be revival be here, God, when they arrive. Many people, hear me tonight, many people, religious folk, will try to tell you that the Holy Ghost was just for the day of Pentecost. They will try to convince you it was just for the book of Acts. They will not deny that tongues was real and evident in the book of Acts, for if they deny that, they deny his word. But they will try to tell you, well, that was just for the book of Acts. That is not supposed to happen today. It's very clear in Scripture, Acts 2.39. For the promise is to you and your children, to all that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. The promise is to you. It is a personal promise. If you are breathing in this house tonight, the promise is for you. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. I wish somebody would help me right now. The promise is for you. Anybody here got the promise? You want to testify about it tonight? The promise is for you. I want to help somebody. It's a family promise. It's to you and your children. Somebody just needs to go ahead and claim some lost family members right now. Come on, somebody believe it. A lost husband, a lost wife, lost children, lost family members. For the promise is to you and your children. To all that are afar off, it's a universal promise. Brother Mallory, that's why they have revival in the Philippines. That's why we send Brother, Brother Adams to Africa. That's, that, that's why we support missions all over the world because the church is not just about Columbia, Mississippi. This is a global church. It's God's church, and it's a universal promise. And if he can pour his spirit here, and he can pour out his spirit there, it doesn't matter any time, any place, anywhere. God is there. To all who are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God will call. It's a timeless promise. God doesn't say, I'm just going to call them in the book of Acts. God didn't just say, I'm just going to fill them full of the Holy Ghost in the book of Acts. No, it's to as many as the Lord our God shall call. This, this is what is so powerful about the Holy Ghost. You can take away from me what I think I know, but you can't take away from me what I have experienced for myself. Do I have anybody here tonight? You know this Holy Ghost that I'm preaching about. You can't take that away from me. I'm not a liar. I, I know what I've experienced. I know what I have. And the same spirit that raised him from the dead that we preached about on Easter Sunday is living in me because I've spoke with other tongues. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Holy Spirit lives in, it lives in me. God has not changed. He is still calling people into the kingdom. The promise has not ended it was not just a book of Acts promise. It's a 21st century promise. And I want you to know it's a 2024 promise. I said it's a 2024 promise. The last verse, hear me. 
I won't be much longer. Of most New Testament books, closes like these. Matthew 28 and 20. You don't have to go there. You can trust me. It's on the screen. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I, whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way even unto the end of the world. Here's that word. Amen. Mark 16 closes its book this way. And they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. What's that word again? Amen. Luke and John both end with amen. Romans 16, 27 ends with amen. First and second Corinthians ends with amen. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. You get the picture. Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, ends with a man. Nearly every book in the New Testament ends with this closing statement, which means, so be it. It denotes finality. It denotes the end of something, a statement of confirmation that everything written before it is complete and settled. There's only two books in the entire New Testament that does not close with a man. James, whose central theme is faith, never closes his book, and you guessed it, the book of Acts. If you don't believe me, you can turn there. What this tells us is that there is no a man. There is no finality to the miraculous as in the book of James and the outpouring of the Holy Ghost found in the book of Acts. Is there anybody thankful tonight? It did not stop with the book of Acts. It's a timeless promise and you can have it tonight. So many people make it so mystical and and, and, and you, you, you know, it, it's, it, the sound's got to be at this decibel for you to get it. And no. This is one reason I wanted to teach on it. You got to come to God with an open heart. You got to come to God with a repentant spirit. You can't have anything that is, that is, that is staying between you and him. You, you, you got to get everything between you and him has got to be a okay you got to come to God with a repentant heart. And repentance is not, I'm sorry that I got caught. Repentance is, I'm sorry that I broke your heart, God, and I want to turn around and I want to make a brand new start. You come to God. You are repentant. You get the Holy Ghost. When you begin to seek Him, His Word says, if you'll seek me, and search for me with all your heart. You will find me. You come to God with a repentant heart. And you begin to worship him. Praise and worship to him. God, I'm not worthy, but you're worthy. You begin to say the highest praise. Hallelujah. You begin to sing and, and, and pray to him. And let me tell you something. God will pour his spirit out on you. I know it because I've seen it for myself. And I've experienced it for myself. It's not something, I want to help you right here. I even want to help altar workers. You don't have to push it into them. You don't have to prod it into them. You don't have to take them down and hope they get it as they make their way to the floor. No, hear me tonight. All you got to do is begin to pray and begin to worship. Open heart, repentant heart, and I'm telling you, the Lord will fill you with his spirit. He will baptize you. I, I say it like this. He will fill you to the point of overflowing. And I don't know why I feel like saying this, but some of people, somebody in here may be questioning, well, why would God use my tongue? Because the book of James tells us that the tongue is the most unruly member of your body. I don't know of a person here tonight that control their tongue 100% of the time. I told you Easter Sunday, if you're, gonna, if you're gonna get in trouble, it's gonna be with your flesh or your mouth. God, so cool. that he said, I'm gonna use the one thing you cannot control to be a sign to you that I am living and dwelling in you because I'm gonna take control of your tongue. 
You can't worry about who's around you. You can't worry about what you're going to do tomorrow. You can't worry. Let me tell you, when you get in that moment of prayer, it's just you and God. You've got to lose all sense of awareness. You've got to lose all sense of, you, you can't be worried about what somebody else is going to think. Are you trying to please them or are you trying to please God? In the early chapters of the book of Acts, several instances occur where individuals or groups are faced with decision about whose side they will align with concerning the message of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bible, make these notes and I'm done. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 26. It's the healing at the gate beautiful. Peter and John healed a lame beggar at the beautiful gate of the temple drawing a crowd and Peter used this opportunity to preach about Jesus as a source of healing and salvation. Some who witnessed the miracle believed and joined the early Christian community while others, particularly the religious leaders, opposed them. There's going to be some people that don't want this. Acts chapter 4, persecution and the council. Peter and John were arrested brought before the religious leaders for preaching about Jesus, performing miracles, faced with the choice of obeying God or obeying men, Peter and John boldly declared their allegiance to Jesus in spite of the threats and the persecution they faced. Acts chapter 4, 18 through 21, take note. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. They told him, you can't do this anymore. But Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, <laughs> finding no way of punishing them because of the people since they all glorified God for what had been done. Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, 1 through 11. You know the story. They tried to deceive God with the property they had sold and they reaped the benefits of their decision. Acts 5, 17 through 42, the apostles before the Sanhedrin, the apostles were arrested, brought before the Sanhedrin for continuing to preach about Jesus. Faced with the choice of obeying God or obeying human authority, the apostles declared their allegiance to Jesus in spite of the threats and the beatings they endured. Acts chapter 5, verse 41. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Wow. And daily in the temple and in every house did they not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as Christ. I think the message here is this. Whose team are you on? What side are you going to choose? Am I going to follow the teachings of the Apostle Peter who had the keys to the kingdom? Or am I going to make my own way and live my own way and decide my own thing? But let me tell you something. If it's in the book, I want it. If it's in the book, I want a pattern my life after it. If it's in the book, if it's a gift for me, I want to possess it. It's called the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why wouldn't you want that gift? I don't know about you, but I'm on team Jesus tonight. If he's got it, I want it. If it was good enough for the apostles, it's good enough for me. If it was good enough for the apostle Peter, it's good enough for me. I don't know about you, but I'm thankful for the gift of the Holy Ghost and what God has given me. Would you stand with me tonight? I'm on team Jesus. I'll say that again. I'm on team Jesus. I'm not trying to, this is a word for somebody. I'm not trying to see how little I can do in order to obtain the promises that he has for me. I'm gonna say that again. I'm not trying to just to just push the envelope to see how close to the world I can get. No. I want to see how much of Jesus I can get. Look at your neighbor and tell him I'm on team Jesus. 
Now that you said that, why don't you live that way? I'm on Team Jesus. I'm so thankful tonight for the gift that is above all gifts, the gift of his spirit that is living in me, that's dwelling in me. Would you lift your hands right now and would you thank him for that wonderful gift? If you have it tonight, why don't you just begin to praise him? Why don't you begin to lift him up? Why don't you begin to give him thanks? Give him thanks tonight. Give him thanks tonight. God, you are so good. When I didn't deserve it, God, you still, oh God, gave me your spirit, Lord. While I was yet a sinner, God, you died for me. You gave your life a ransom for me, oh God. Oh God. God continues to renew his people. This is not a one-time gift. You don't get it and say, hey, I don't ever need it again. No, I need it every day. I need him to renew me in his spirit, renew me in his power, renew me in his love. Because I fail. I fall short. I make mistakes. Anybody with me tonight? I, I need a renewing power of the Holy Ghost. I said, I need a renewing power of the Holy Ghost. So I want to close this service making a commitment. God, if your word teaches it, I want it. I commit my life to you, Lord. I need your spirit above all else. I can't make it without your spirit. I can't make it without your anointing. I need a, I need a fresh dose every single day. Come on, if you're with me, lift your hand. Mm. I need you every single day. This altar tonight, as they begin to sing, is open to anyone that wants to walk to this altar. Maybe you've never received the Holy Ghost. Maybe you've never experienced what I preached about tonight. That doesn't make you less than, hear me tonight, that doesn't make you less than, that just means God's got a promise for you and all you gotta do is take it. I said, God's got a promise for you and all you have to do is receive it, take it. Or maybe you're here tonight, and you've been struggling. The devil has been attacking you. Maybe you failed recently, maybe you have just fallen flat on your face or Maybe you just haven't experienced God the way you wanted to in a long time. God's got a renewing power for you tonight. This is First Wednesday worship. We're going to close this service tonight giving praise and worship to our God. But I wonder before we begin to sing, is there anybody that wants to get out of your seat, walk to this altar and lift your hands and say, God, if you've got something for me, I want to receive it tonight. God, if you want to pour your spirit out on me, God, I want to receive it tonight. I want you to look at your neighbor right now and ask him, can I walk with you to this altar? Come on, Keith, the Lord's got a promise for you. That's it, brother. This man graduated. You belong here tonight. God's got a promise for you. Can I have a prayer warrior come with me right now? We're going to believe right now. Come on, keep coming. Keep coming. Uh, the Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost is here. The Holy Ghost is here. I wish I had some prayer warriors in this altar tonight. You will begin to pray and intercede right now over somebody close to you, somebody standing next to you right now. Yeah, we need a fresh wind. God, we need a fresh wind.